I'm Larry Walther. This is PrinciplesofAccounting.com, Chapter 9. In this module, we'll be looking at accounting for the investment category held to maturity. So, held to maturity are those investments that were purchased with the intent to maintain them for the life of the investment to a fixed maturity date, typically accounted for by the amortized cost method. Bonds are an example of a typical held to maturity security. A bond enables a large corporation to borrow amounts from lenders where maybe a single lender is not large enough or has the capacity to make the loan. Instead, the company issues bonds enabling many different individual investors to buy bonds or in essence loan money to the company through small units. For example, a bond issuer may borrow $500 million by issuing 500,000 individual $1,000 face amount bonds to raise the full $500 million amount. Now, there's some terms that are important to know when you consider bonds. The face amount, that's the amount that's to be repaid at maturity, typically a $1,000 amount. The contract or stated rate of interest is the payment that is contractually agreed to, for example, 5% per year or perhaps paid semi-annually, 2.5% semi-annually, for example. The term is the time to maturity, for example, 5 years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever that might be. Here's an example. A $1,000, 5% 10 year bond would pay $50 per year of interest for 10 years. Uh, and then it would repay the $1,000 at maturity. So an investor would initially give money to the company, the company would issue the bonds to the investor, and those bonds would require periodic interest payments, and then at the maturity of the bond, the full face amount back to the investor. It's just a loan, in other words. Uh, how much would one pay for a bond? What would be the issue price? Well, it really depends on many factors, including the credit worthiness of the issuer, the remaining time to maturity, and the overall market conditions for bonds at the time they're issued. We can think about a going rate or market rate of interest for bonds. Uh, let's assume the going rate or market rate was 8% at the time that a company attempted to issue a 5% bond. Well, who would want the 5%? And the answer is really no one unless they could buy it at a discount. Conversely, if the going rate of interest, the market rate was 3%, everyone would clamor to buy 5% bonds. They would actually bid the price of the bonds up such that the investment would be at a premium. If the market rate of interest and stated rate of interest are similar, we would expect the bond to issue or sell or price at par. If the interest rate on a particular bond, the contract rate is above the market rate of interest, we would expect a premium and conversely for a discount. Price is stated as a percentage of face. 103 means 103% of face value or for a $1,000 bond, the price would be $1,030. An investment bond account is established at the time of purchase. It includes the purchase price of the bonds plus the transaction costs. Any premiums or discount on those bonds are included in the carrying value of the investment and bonds account. Here's an example of a bond issued at par. The investor buys the bond, debit investment and bonds 5,000, credit cash 5,000. As interest payments are received, we debit cash and credit interest. We bought $5,000 of bonds yielding interest at 5% per year, so that's uh, $250 per year, and we're dealing with six months here or half a year, so we expect to collect $125 of interest income. That entry would be made at each interest payment date, and of course any accrued interest at the end of the accounting cycle would also need to be recorded. At maturity, we get our $5,000 back, debit cash, credit investment, and bonds. Now, for example, assume the same facts as on the preceding 5% bond, but this time the market rate of interest was less than 5% when the bond was issued. Now the bond would be purchased at a premium. Simply assume we invested a $5,000 face amount of bonds at $5,300. We'll record the investment at $5,300 and credit cash $5,300. Now, the investor paid an extra $300 because they recognized the value associated with the superior rate of interest on these particular bonds. Uh, but we're only going to get $5,000 back at maturity. That $300 we're willing to pay up front, we don't get back. We get it back in higher interest payments, but we don't get it back in terms of maturity value. The maturity value is only $5,000. And so we have an accounting challenge here. The investor pays more than the face value up front. The bond's maturity value is unchanged. The investor is likely generating higher annual interest receipts. Now let's look at the calculations here. We collect our $125, that's the 5% of the $5,000 face for half a year. Of the 125 received, 75 is recorded as interest income, the other 50 is retreated as return of the investment. The $50 corresponds to the premium amortization, $300 of premium, and this was a three-year life bond, so we'll need to amortize that over three years. It comes to $50 every six months allocated evenly over the life of the bond under this approach, which is the straight line method of amortization. In a subsequent chapter, we'll look at it in effective interest method amortization as well. 
that premium amortization is credited against the investment in bonds account as shown in the journal entry, and that process would continue with each interest payment date. This entry reflects that we get the $5,000 back at maturity, debit, cash, and credit, investment, and bonds. That $5,000 is the right amount for the investment in bonds at that point because it started at $5,300, but we took $50 out of that account every six months for three years, or $300 in other words, so we're down to that amount. Let's think about the cash effects. We invested $5,300. We got back $5,750. That is $125 every six months for three years and $5,000 maturity. That's a difference of $450, and indeed, that's the amount of income we recognized under this method. Our journal entry showed $75 of interest income every six months for three years, or a total of $450. So indeed, the change in cash is what we recognized as interest income. Here's a spreadsheet that's also repeated in the textbook. It reveals the cash flow and the activity for each payment. We, we initially had $5,300 of cash going out. We had $125 coming in and $5,000 at maturity. So the net change in cash corresponds to the total interest income where we recognize $75 at each interest payment date. The difference is our premium amortization, which is offset against the investment account reflecting the decline in investment. Discount on bonds is just the opposite. We'll essentially look at the same illustration in reverse here. An investor pays less than face value up front, but the bond's maturity value is unchanged. So we're going to get back more money than we invested in addition to the periodic cash payment. We bought this bond at a discount, though, because it was sort of an inferior bond. It didn't pay very much on a periodic interest payment. So let's assume we have the same faxes for the first bond, but this time the market rate of interest, when we bought the 5% bond, the market rate was more than that, so we had to buy this at a discount or not be interested. Up front, we bought the bond for $4,850, so we'll debit investment in bonds $4,850 and credit cash $4,850. The investor gets the other $150 back at maturity when they get their $5,000 back, and so that $150,000 needs to be amortized over the three years at $25 every six months. So if we look at the journal entry, our cash flow is the same, 5000 times 5% for half a year. At each interest payment date, we'll debit cash $125. Our investment in bond account is reduced by $25, however, to reflect the amortization, the $150 spread over three years. And we're going to book $150 as interest income. At maturity, we get our $5,000 back, debit cash, and credit investment in bonds, $5,000. Thinking about the cash, we paid out $4,850. We still got back the contracted $5,750, a difference of $900, which should be recognized as interest income. And indeed, $150 every six months for three years comes to $900. It's not difficult, but it's, it involves some complexity that takes you a while to get your arms around it. And I know from years of teaching experience that this is one subject where students struggle sometimes. And so uh, don't be frustrated by your struggle, but do press through it until you get your arms around this topic.